Good afternoon. Welcome to Sydney Riley Master Spy with Benny Morris. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for joining us. We are really pleased to host this talk about Riley as he is such an iconic and mysterious spy. And we're lucky enough to have an artifact related to his life on display in our covert action gallery. And I know that our historian and curator, Dr. Andrew Hammond will be talking about that as well as leading the conversation with Benny. Benny is a distinguished Israeli historian with many publications to his name, but the latest and the inspiration for this program is Sidney Riley, Master Spy. Just a reminder, when Andrew and Benny finish their discussion, we'll turn to your questions and please um, use the Q&A feature to write them in. Uh, we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible. I kind of anticipate we're gonna get a lot of questions. Uh, so enough from me, over to you, Andrew and Benny. Thanks, Amanda. Well, it's, yeah. it's a real pleasure to speak to you, Benny. As I mentioned, I came across one of your books quite a while ago, Righteous Victims, and uh, it really uh, informed my understanding of, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So it's a real pleasure to speak to you. But Thank you. Really... Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm really excited to speak to you about Sidney Riley uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, one of the first things that I just wanted to get my head around for our listeners is help us understand just a little bit who he was. So I'm not talking about Sidney Riley, I'm talking about Shlomo Rosenblum. So just take us back to the beginning of the story. So Sidney Riley is, a, is, so, is an invented name. Uh, he's, he claims to be born in Tipperary in Ireland. <laughs> but actually, the story is a little bit different from that. So take us back to the beginning of the story when he's Shlomo Rosenblum, please. OK, as, as, as far as we know, and the, the documentary evidence for his early years is um, questionable or non-existent um, is he can't, he was a young Jew from uh, Odessa, probably born in Odessa or near Odessa in Kherson, um, places incidentally which have recently been in the news in the war between Ukraine and Russia. Um, and he um, left home probably at the age of 17 or 18. Um, he fled from the Tsarist secret police because he was involved apparently with some revolutionaries. He fled to South America and then eventually made his way to England, where he started uh, working as an agent, uh, eventually with what can be called a spy. Um, but his original name, of course, was a, a Jewish name, uh, Sigmund or Shlomo Rosenblum. Um, the name Sidney Riley was an acquired name, uh, which he picked up along the way, either on his own initiative or because his uh, agent runners um, in England, wanted him to have a non-Jewish name. And, and, and the city of Odessa, like on the research for this program, it's really, really fascinating, the, the backstory of Odessa, and you bring it out in the book. At the time, it's a third Jewish um, when Riley's born. Uh, some of the people that come from there are Trotsky, grew up there quite substantially. Jabotinsky, who, whose uh, protege goes on to found the Likud party in Israel, Menahem Begin. Uh, you have the Potemkin mutiny that's featured in the, in the famous uh, uh, movie Battleship Potemkin by Sergei Eisenstein. So it's just a, it's a really, really fascinating city. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And did you manage to yeah. visit it? People have written, I, I'm not me, but people have written a histories or biographies of the city called Odessa. And it was a sort of an outpost of the Tsarist empire on the Black Sea um, and was very cosmopolitan. This is its uh, virtue, if you like. Uh, all sorts of people lived there, um, including about a quarter of the population, which was Jewish or a third of the population. There were Muslims, Christians, traders, Italians, Frenchmen, uh, everybody who passed along the, the, the Black Sea um, either militarily or in terms of commerce, 
ended up in Odessa, and it also had a number of um, important characters uh, sent there by the Tsar from Moscow, who built um, nice buildings in the, in the like, tried to uh, build a Western type type city um, on the Black Sea, not just a sort of a um, a backwater of the Russian Empire. So it was very cosmopolitan, and um, Riley benefited from this um, by learning languages there, which was, of course, very useful for his future career as, as a spy and as a, um, um, a merchant. Um, and he made contacts there who also periodically reappear during his spying and commercial uh, life uh, in Japan, in uh, uh, America, and so on. So um, his base in Odessa was very important in his construction, um, but he always um, publicly, or at least in terms of his contacts in the British um, espionage world, re renounced or rejected or didn't admit to these origins. And part of the story that you bring out in the book as well is that he also rejected or renounced his Jewish identity by and large. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Well, the book actually came out in a series called Jewish Lives, which has um, includes um, books about Houdini and Trotsky and uh, um, um, Einstein and Freud and Moses and King David and so on. And he's a sort of an unlikely character in this um, uh, Jewish Jewish Lives series. And I'm not exactly sure why they asked me to write this biography because he was somebody who rejected his Jewishness and Jew Jewish roots. Um, um, and as I say, even adopted this name from Tipperary rather than uh, staying with his original um, um, name. Um, but but um, there was something also very Jewish about him, uh, uh, even though he rejected this uh, attribution, this affiliation. Um, uh, he was multilingual, which was quite common among Jews in Central and sort of Eastern Europe. Um, he was also commercially minded, which is something Jews often did in Eastern and Central Europe. They worked in uh, various um, trades and middlemen of various types. And this is what he he um, did si alongside his uh, espionage career. Or if you like, um, the espionage career was the side sideline um, to his commercial uh, enterprises. And there's a few things that I want to touch on specifically, but just to give our listeners a flavour of him, some of the things that you identify in the book. In 1895, he's living in Paris. He attacked and robbed two anarchist couriers, probably slitting one of their throats. He potentially poisoned a 65-year-old Welsh reverend so he could be with his 23-year-old wife, whom he seduced. He joined the Royal Flying Corps in Canada. He ran a flight school in St. Petersburg, and he had a string of lovers that could circ circumnavigate the world if you were to put a pin in every country. I mean, he's uh, that must this must have been so difficult to try to log in the book because it's it's, it's very... He's all over the place and he's doing so many different things. Yeah, no, he's very multifaceted. This is true. He was apparently sort of a legendary as a lover. He had four wives simultaneously. He was a bigamist, but he also had mistresses on the side, as you say, in almost every port. Um, I don't know if he ever actually flew. This is something which was not clear to me. He became a lieutenant in the Canadian branch of the RAF. Um, uh, but it's not clear whether they actually did um, a flight training or actually flew planes. We don't know that. Um, he certainly, uh, so, some of the things attributed to him, we don't know whether they're true or not. And among those things are that, that killing, that robbing and killing of an anarchist um, courier who was carrying money apparently on, on a train in France. Um, he and another guy, it, it is assumed uh, robbed this uh, character and killed him, uh, as you say, maybe slitting his throat. Uh, but we don't we don't know that for sure. It's a pos it's a good possibility. Uh, certainly, he escaped or ran, uh, fled from France um, immediately after this. So this sort of links him to this event. Um, but as I say, certain things we seem to know about Riley are not necessarily true. <laughs> 
it's all well, let me get back to this business of the wives it's probably true for this there seems to be evidence that he did get rid of the priest or pastor or whatever you want to call it who was married to this young woman called margaret uh, who was an irish woman um, she was 23 and he apparently got rid of his her uh, husband um, together with um, her they did it apparently together and um, then married her but he dumped her fairly quickly as well certainly after she became an alcoholic <laughs> <laughs> and there's and he's quite often being compared to James Bond and of course there's this famous quote where Ian Fleming said James Bond is just some nonsense I dreamed up he's no Sidney Riley uh, and there's one quote that you have in the book from Nazedda um, and she's debriefed in the United States by the Bureau of Investigation, which will go on to become the FBI. And she says, I saw him and immediately decided I had to have him. What, what, like, just, just, just because of the connection to Bond, what was it that was so magnetic about him to women or to, to other people that, that made them trust him? This isn't completely uh, intelligible to me. Uh, when you see Sean Connery in the movies as James Bond, you can understand why women fall for him. He's got this magnetism. He's very, he's big. Um, he, he's got a nice accent. Um, um, Riley apparently, incidentally, had ter a terrible accent in most languages. His na native uh, language was Russian, and everybody immediately understood that he wasn't a proper Irishman, which he's supposed to have been as a Riley or an Englishman. Um, but but he had this tremendous attraction for uh, uh, on the part of women. That is, they they found him extremely attractive. You can't understand it from the the photographs. Um, <clears throat> I my assumption is that he was a good listener, which is a, 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 an important element in attraction, and he had this reputation as someone covert who does dangerous things. And this it's in itself is an aphrodisiac also. So that that that's probably what it was about. But in terms of the way he looked, uh, you don't see it, but um, the proof's in the pudding. I mean, he had these millions of mistresses. <laughs> and and tell us a little bit more. So that that beginning part is is very interesting, and we see him go on to become the Sydney Riley of legend. So I think one of the important chapters here that a lot of people probably don't know about is the Darcy affair, which I think is. I think is really, really interesting. Could you just tell the listeners a little bit more about that? Well, we're talking about the time when oil started becoming important in the world economy, and especially among navies, which wanted to convert from coal to uh, oil. And leading the, the charge, of course, was the British Navy, the Navy in the world uh, around the year 1900. Um, and um, there was exploration for oil around the Middle East, especially in Persia. And the, the question was, how were, who was going to get the oil from Persia? And uh, he was injected into this or injected himself into a deal in which non-British uh, um, um, businessmen were going to get the commission to dr look for and then take out the oil from Persia. And the British government, uh, the admiralty, the, the, the part of the government in charge of the British fleet, which was interested in oil, um, apparently uh, used Riley to um, neutralize the competition and acquire um, uh, the rights to drilling and extracting oil from Persia uh, for this man, Darcy, who was an agent of the British uh, in this sense, um, in the, the pursuit of the oil. I've got this... Uh, moth flying around here. Um, um, so he apparently appeared as a, a priest or in some sort of guise, not as a British agent, of course, and managed, and we don't know exactly how, there's a number of different stories, but he managed to persuade a, 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 the extension of the Persians in this thing to a, give the rights to what became British Petroleum. And sometimes Riley has been, <clears throat> I've, I've seen him described sometimes as sure he was great at blending in and, and finding himself into particular places that he needed to be, but ultimately he wasn't particularly successful. I think 
Christopher Andrew, one of the you know most well-known intelligence historians, ultimately decides that he's not particularly effectual. But I mean, it seems to me that, that by just by the Darcy affair alone, ensuring that the the world's leading navy were the were the ones that got access to oil so that they could be the first to transfer from coal to oil. I mean, this basically prolongs Britain's naval supremacy for for quite a substantial period of time. And of course, BP is still an enormously uh, successful commercial company. So it seems to me that this ineffectualness is, is, is misplaced. Would you agree? Well, the, the problem with all this is that we don't really know if the whole Darcy story is correct. We don't know if Riley was the man who was instrumental in getting um, the oil concession for um, Britain's agents. Um, we don't really know that. We don't have the documentation. It's a story. And Riley himself, incidentally, used to um, spread these stories about himself, some of which may have been true and some of which weren't. It's a bit unusual for a spy to do this, but he was self, um, um, you know, um, projecting sort of um, a, a spy. In other words, he talked about his um, um, <clears throat> successes. I don't know if he talked about his failures, but he talked about successes and some of the su successes may not have been true. <clears throat> so we don't we don't really know uh, the truth about every one of the stories. Some of the stories certainly are true and some we have documentation for. And those are the ones I would rely on. And that's in, in essence, I think the core of my book is what he was doing in Russia um, in 1917, 18, 19, um, uh, that we know is true and we have his reports from there uh, and we know from others, uh, reports from other spies and political agents, um, uh, what he was up to and what he tried to do and what he failed to do. But most of the other um, escapades which are connected to his name uh, are not properly documented, to put it simply. So, so you've, been go <laughs> you've been going through the files and the other books on Riley to help write this if you were to so you know probably as much as as much as anybody if you were to put a percentage on the Darcy affair being true where where would you put it would it be 50 percent 80 percent 20 percent 50 percent sounds about right okay Okay. <laughs> He's a very elusive figure. <laughs> yes. yes. No, look, I, look, let me say something about documentation, and this is important. Firstly, in general, documentation about spies is hard to get to. It's usually kept secret, and often it's not even his, the spies' um, operations are not even documented uh, anywhere available, certainly. Um, the MI6, the spy organization for which he worked for three years in um, the British and Secret Intelligence Service um, during the years 1918-21 uh, um, wouldn't release its files to me. They did actually release their file on Riley or their files on Riley to one or two previous biographers of Riley, but then there was a change of director general of the MI6 and uh, the new one uh, refuses to allow access um, to files in general to historians. Um, so I, that I didn't see. Um, I was a, a privy to and I did see uh, the file of MI5 on Riley. MI5 was sort of sicked on Riley to see if he was actually genuine and to see what what uses what what use he could be for for Britain. So they trailed, they wandered around London, uh, uh, trailing after him, seeing what he was up to um, and so on and kept a file on this. And that, that's an interesting file. Interesting also is the KGB file on Riley. They may have more than one file, but at least one of their files in the KGB archive, it's got a different name now, but it is actually KGB. Um, th that file is actually open to researchers, which is strange. The British file is closed on him. The KGB file is open, though most of the material there of interest is about his um, eventual demise. And, and we'll go on to that. So let's let's walk up to the plot, which I think is, as you say, that's a central part of your book. But just before we get there, let's just briefly talk about World War One, because 
during this period, it's, it's, it's really incredible what he does. He moves to New York and becomes a multimillionaire. Uh, he's, yeah, he ate well, he gambled, he partied, he traveled, he stayed in expensive hotels. I mean, he basically lived the life of James Bond. <laughs> he probably lived a couple of rungs higher than James Bond. He was a millionaire. James Bond, nobody ever said, was a millionaire. Um, though it's worth remembering that James Bond actually kills people. He doesn't actually spy about anything. If you look at James Bond, spies are supposed to extract information for the use of their government. James, um, James Bond doesn't extract information. He kills people. Um, and Riley's different in that sense. The Riley may kill some people, but he's actually there gathering information. Um, yeah, sorry. Are you, are you, um, are you... Yeah, sorry. World War One. Just tell yeah, us World a little War bit one, more yeah. about yeah. Riley and World Ry War One. Riley, because of his the connections he managed to establish in the Russian um, military structure um, during the the first decade of the twentieth century, um, was in some way um, plugged into the beginning of World War One as a Russian. A arms purchaser. That is, he managed to get from the Russians a, a, a note of authorization. We actually have a, co a copy of that um, a, authorizing him to purchase arms on behalf of Russia, which was, of course, deeply engaged in World War I against the German and the Austro-Hungarian armies and needed munitions, needed uh, uh, guns and so on. And um, so he traveled to Japan and then to New York, uh, Riley, uh, with this uh, authorization to work on behalf of the Russian government purchasing arms, and uh, of course took a big commission, a big commission being 2% of 2% of $100 million is a lot of money. So, and he made uh, deals of, of that size. So he made a lot of money in America during the years 1914, 1917, basically as a, um, an agent uh, of arms um, um, manufacturers and on the other side, the Russian uh, government. Um, and um, as you say, he probably spent a lot of it on uh, women gambling, uh, good hotels um, and fast cars, if there were such things in 1915. <laughs> <laughs> and and one of the, the things of which I think, is, you know, particularly interesting is I feel like he would have made an amazing Secretary of State or Foreign Minister, <laughs> because he seems to get these people to agree to things you know, become a middleman between <laughs> the United States and the, the various parties in World War I, talk uh, Darcy into getting Persian oil. He just seems to have a remarkable ability to persuade people, to sway them, to, to bring them around to his way of thinking and to reach some kind of middle ground where, you know, he benefits from it, but the other parties are happy too. But this is true about some of some of the years in which he's operating and not true about others. In America, the Americans were very suspicious of him, the American government. Basically, they thought he was a German agent, um, uh, which he wasn't, uh, apparently, as far as we know. Uh, he certainly was a Russian agent. Um, there was a lot of corruption there in the arms deals, not just getting uh, percentages of each deal, but also making money on the side as a result of these deals. Um, and he was doing that apparently as well. Um, but at some point, um, he made contact with British agents in America, agents of MI6 in America, and then uh, decided to stop making money and uh, start serving what he regarded as, as his country, as adopted country, um, um, and becomes an officer in the British Air Force or the Canadian extension of the British Air Force and, and um, becomes then an MI6 agent, which is very interesting. A officer, actually. Um, I suppose you can call it an agent as well. And why, and why does he have this affinity for, for Great Britain, Benny? Because you point out in the book that he serves different governments at different periods of time but the his loyalty to britain seemed to trump everything else like help us understand where that came from yeah I, i'm not sure he actually works for other governments they, he was accused and suspected of working for the germans and even for the russians uh, the czarist russians but really i think his only national loyalty was is for the british and it's not really explicable um except britain's a capitalist country um i think he has some um, good feeling or sympathy for the British Navy and the British way of life in, in some way, at least the upper class way of life. 
we're talking about the Savoy Hotel or whatever, gambling houses in England, um, uh, maybe he's even a Democrat in some way. He, he, he hates uh, the Tsarist Russian regime from the beginning. He's oppressed by them, persecuted by them as a youngster. Um, he doesn't like them. Um, he doesn't like the socialists who overthrow the Tsar. Uh, we will get to that, I suppose, in a second. Um, I think he appreciates the capitalism and the democracy and the high culture uh, uh, of Brit British high culture society, that is, the upper classes, uh, which is he, he's trying to become. He tries to become an upper class Englishman, despite his Russian Jewish accent. Um, uh, this is always pointed out. <laughs> <laughs> And, and let's walk forward to the, the Riley Lockhart plot. So he's in New York, 1917. He's a multimillionaire. It seems that to a lot of people, it would seem a little bit crazy that he would give all of that up to go and get involved in, you know, quite dangerous activities. So you just tell us a little bit more about how he gets involved here and then explain the, the Lockhart plot. Well, um, I, I'm not sure how much, how many millions he actually makes in, in America and how wealthy he is. He's got money and he's making piles, but he's also spending piles. The women cost a lot. The gambling costs a lot. Um, uh, he seems to, and he, he loses it also in business enterprises of his own, apart from being a middleman between uh, people who are selling and buying arms. Um, so he doesn't have that much money. Uh, the war is winding down. And I think because of his attachment to Britain, he wants to become a proper Englishman. And that means serving the British government as a servant of the British government. And he likes spying. He did that for years before, again, on a sort of an amateur basis for the special branch of the Scotland Yard against all sorts of anarchists in London and Paris um, around the fin de siècle. Um, uh, but he wants something more permanent, um, which again would be sort of nail down his the permanency of his citizenship and his belonging to Britain. And that's when he, he meets British um, um, intelligence operatives in um, Washington and in New York. And uh, he takes to them and they take to him. And they're the ones who basically launch him on this career uh, going to the um, Air, uh, Canadian Air Force, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and then from there on to MI6 in London. And, and, and London, and let me just add, and London is very interested in him because at that crucial moment, uh, when the Bolsheviks have just taken over Russia, uh, they need people in Russia who know Russia, who can speak Russian, who can operate in Russia, and that's why they take him on. Otherwise, they wouldn't have taken him on. And we have an image uh, of a cigar box that we have at the museum, which is a uh, a crystallization almost of this Riley Lockhart plot. And if you read the text on it, it says, you know, basically it's to Bruce Lockhart, his co-conspirator, and Riley's saying, in, re in remembrance of the events that we jointly, you know, were part of in 1918 in Russia. So it's a, it's a memento from Riley, to Bruce Lockhart, who goes on to have a very distinguished career as a, a young, high-flying uh, person within the British government. So this cigar box is just, it's just so fascinating to me, uh, this connection to this plot. And, and one of the reasons why the plot is so important is because the Russians have recently made a peace treaty with the Germans. And the reason why Lockhart and Riley want to overthrow the Bolshevik regime is so that the Russians will come back into the war because the Allies don't want a one-front war. They want a two-front war, so Germany's forces are divided. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They, they, they want to keep Germany out of Russia and Russia out of German hands. Uh, this is one of the driving forces of what happens. But Riley, um, from the beginning, hates the Bolsheviks. He hates revolutionaries. This is from his younger days. Um, a, a spying for the special branch in a London and probably in Paris. A, he doesn't like revolutionaries. Um, 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 and and he, his anti-Bolshevism, I think, is the most important thing there, though, since the war is still ongoing, um, as you say, 
he also has to try and keep Russia out of German hands. In other words, to um, um, make sure that the Russians and the Germans don't uh, make common cause, perhaps against Britain. And we're talking about the last months of World War I. But eventually, uh, his efforts um, um, focus on, on, on the regime in Russia, which he regards as a mortal danger to Western civilization. In fact, he uses the same sort of terminology in regard to the Bolsheviks as did Churchill, somebody he actually knew and met. Um, they were in complete agreement about the danger of um, international, what later is called international communism, Bolshevism to the West. He also personally knew C from MI6, yes, the head yes. of MI6. Well, he's hired by Cumming. Cumming is the is the head of M, the legendary head of MI6. The original, yeah. <laughs> yes, the original C, who's called M in the James Bond movies, but um, he's the original head of uh, writes uh, his letters in in Greek, Greek, green ink. Um, he, he coming when he ha, coming has a very small organization. MI6 at the beginning of World War One is very small. He gradually expands it and turns it into a world encompassing intelligence agency. And 1917, 18, once the Bolsheviks take over in Russia, Russia becomes a focal point of MI6 um, uh, operations. Uh, either to subvert the regime or to prevent them from joining the Germans, etc. Um, so Cumming basically calls Riley once he hears about him, and Riley has people uh, going to Cumming and pleading his case. Uh, Cumming invites him into his office. It's a well-described uh, situation. Well, what happens in that office in London, a sort of a, an attic, um, calls, calls uh, Riley in, and we have a sort of a description of that meeting um, um, and he takes him aboard and uh, coming who kept the diary. I, it's not open to historians to see, but but um, people have quoted from that diary, people who were given access. And um, coming basically says, I don't trust this guy, but he's useful for us and we'll take him on. Um, Riley, who has, uh, I think he's one leg or something, because during World War One, his car overturns and the uh, in order to extricate himself from the Rolls Royce, uh, uh, which is on top of him, he has to cut off his own leg with a knife this coming. That's one of the major components of the legend of uh, C. And uh, there's a lot of mythology surrounding the Lockhart Riley plot to overthrow the Bolsheviks. Like, just give us a crystallization of it for our listeners. Like, what did you take it to be? What, what could you find out for sure? Okay, for sure, uh, uh, Riley is sent into Russia. He arrives in the north in Murmansk and comes down to St. Petersburg and eventually to Mos uh, Moscow uh, at the time when Lockhart is sent as the British agent to uh, Moscow uh, to take care of British Bolshevik relations, to sort of sound out the Bolsheviks. Will they stay in the war? Will they uh, make common cause with Britain? Um, and, and Riley and Lockhart meet. And they understand, uh, certainly Riley understands, but apparently Lockhart understands that the Bolsheviks are not going to play ball with the, uh, the Western powers, and they may even go to uh, join uh, the Germans. Um, and, and they decide together, apparently together. And here there's prob problems because we have a lot of correspondence from Lockhart to the Foreign Office where, for which he works in London, um, explaining what he does and, and what others are doing. Uh, but we don't have Riley's own um, um, contributions in writing for what he's doing in uh, Moscow. But apparently the two of them together devise this idea, this plot um, to overthrow um, um, the, the Bolshevik regime. In fact, um, the part of the one of the main ideas in this uh, coup is to take hold of Trotsky and Lenin and uh, take off their pants and march them up the street uh, of Moscow, up a street um, in their underpants to show how, in, to show them up in some way. And um, this will help to overthrow the regime. At least that's the plot. Um, Lockhart later, of course, denies that um, he was party to the plot, but there's sufficient evidence to show that he had made common cause with um, Riley and some other diplomats, the French diplomats, um, even an American diplomat in, in, in Moscow um, to back such a plot. And Riley was the man on the ground, the operations officer who organizes the various Russian agents who are supposed to carry out this coup. In other words, to take over um, the Bolshevik leadership and Bolshevik strongholds 
in Moscow. And are Riley and Lockhart operating independently or has this plot been sanctioned by the British government or do we just not know? We don't really know. Uh, Lockhart uh, um, and Riley later understood that the British had sort of said, given them the nod and said, go ahead, but we can't be associated with it officially. If you guys are caught or if you guys are stopped, we will say this has nothing to do with this. This is a rogue operation by by uh, Riley. That's how uh, the, uh, Lockhart sees it. And that's how um, um, uh, the British relate to what happened. It's embarrassing. A, a failed plot is always embarrassing. A successful plot has a lot of fathers. Um, th this one didn't have. Um, the problem with the plot was that the Bolsheviks um, intelligence service, the Cheka, uh, later called the KGB, um, got onto the plot which in which Riley was supposed to essentially use a battalion or more of Lithuanian troops who worked for the Bolsheviks at the time in Moscow. He was supposed to mobilize, enroll these troops to help him physically get hold of the um, uh, Bolshevik leaders and the Bolshevik strongholds in Moscow. The Cheka uh, heard about this. They had their own informants uh, within the Bolshevik, uh, within the a Lithuanian a, a battalion or a brigade. And, and a, a, so the Cheka followed what Riley was doing and a, eventually closed down the plot in a number of massive raids in which they took hold of people, a, killed them, a, tortured them. And a, Riley himself was extremely a, lucky to a, get out uh, using various disguises, he managed to make it to St. Petersburg and then to get on a boat and flee the country. Uh, this was a major success, just getting out of there, out of Russia. Lockhart wasn't as lucky, but he did have diplomatic cover. Um, so Lockhart was put in uh, jail for a month or so, um, but also eventually expelled or traded for a Russian who has been taken hostage by the British government in London. And what's your take on the relationship between Riley and Lockhart? Because Lockhart and Lockhart's son, they, they do quite a lot to propagate the Riley myth. So I'm just wondering, what's your, what's your take on the original Lockhart and Riley? I, I think Lockhart, no, Lockhart also wrote that Riley is an extremely intelligent man, extremely capable, knows the languages, knows Russia like the back of his hand, knows Russia much better than I or anybody else. Um, from outside can know it and is is very useful to us. They, this was clear. Um, and they gave Lockhart uh, millions of rubles to carry out this plot. And this isn't the, this isn't the myth. This is true. They gave Lockhart lots of, um, they gave Riley lots of money to actually carry out, to organize this plot. Um, so, but, but, but um, uh, we don't know what Riley thought of Lockhart, but afterwards when Riley returns to England, he um, mobilizes Lockhart to help him in his career in MI6, and for a period he's successful. In other words, um, Riley is not dumped immediately after the failure of the plot in Russia, um, but is maintained by MI6 um, um, uh, with, with Lockhart lobbying for him uh, in London and uh, stays on the payroll for another year or two. And Lockhart is such a fascinating figure as well. You mention, you mention in the book that he's one of the mavericks that comes up every generation from the rather staid British system of, of producing bureaucrats and so forth. And, you know, he's, he's just has this incredible life. And he, I think he goes to set the civil service exams and his results are off the charts. He basically just gets told, choose what you want. Um, so he's he's a really fascinating figure as well. Yeah, well, Lockhart is a fascinating figure. Uh, there's the famous story about his romance in Malaya with a, a local princess and how the family almost kills him. Eventually, he uh, has a mistress in Russia, which is uh, problematic um, uh, for him as well, uh, being a British uh, diplomat. Um, and eventually has another Russian mistress who uh, is even a, a mistress of Maxim Gorky and uh, maybe H.G. Wells in, in England eventually when she comes to England. So he, he has a, also a knack for uh, finding women and interesting women. Um, they have a fascination with Riley. Uh, 
I think partly because Riley is such a shady character. In other words, he's a man of so many different um, functions and, and appearances that that they they are um, uh, in some way taken taken with him. And um, um, if he had succeeded uh, in overthrowing the regime there, uh, he in some ways even thought of himself as the future leader of Russia. He had this Napoleon complex, uh, Riley. Um, he also had a Napoleonic collection, a collection of things connected with Napoleon, which he eventually sold for a lot of money in uh, America. This happens to be true because the New York Times wrote a report about that sale of his Napoleonica in, in New York. Um, but he has this, com this idea of uh, himself being in charge in some way. And this comes up, comes up again towards the end of his life in the mid 1920s, just before he's murdered by the Russians. In, in which he sees himself as perhaps the the, the head of the rev counter revolutionary movement, which will um, uh, throw out the, and replace the Bolsheviks. A lot of conclusions have been drawn from the Lockhart Riley plot, and some of them have been well, the plot failed, therefore Riley failed. But it seems to me that this is this is not a particularly productive way to look at it because it, it, to me it doesn't seem it seems like more of a long shot. This is like a a hail mary. It's not it's not something that necessarily has a great chance of succeeding. But but if it can succeed and if there's a chance it can succeed, it's worth attempting it. So that's that's the way that it seems to me. Rather than oh well they screwed it up it didn't work. Yeah, no, I think you have this right. Look, the, the, the major thrust of overthrowing in overthrowing the Bolshevik regime wasn't the plot inside Moscow. It was the Western armies converging on Moscow and St. Petersburg. And the Western armies did land in Murmansk and Archangel and in Vladivostok. And they sort of began to close in on the Russians. And um, they thought maybe a, a this foreign invasion would uh, oust the Bolsheviks. The idea of a couple of spies with a few local agents and mistresses and whatever taking care of the Russian regime is a bit far-fetched, but uh, it's worth a few million rubles to invest in. Let's give it a try. And that's what appear apparently happened. And we're, we're running out of time. I want to leave some time for questions. So I just want to move on to... Um, We've got Shlomo Rosenblum, we've got Sidney Riley, and then quite tragically, we end up with Prisoner 73. <laughs> Can you just tell us about this experience? He gets lured back to Russia, he's imprisoned. Uh, yeah, just explain for our listeners what happens there. Well, Riley is eventually dumped. Once the relations uh, uh, between Britain and the new regime in Moscow, uh, the Bolsheviks, uh, simmer down and they learn to live with each other. Um, C coming, uh, MI6 doesn't need Riley anymore and they dump him, they fire him. And But Riley has this bug, this, this obsession with getting rid of the Bolshevik regime. And maybe he has this idea that if he can get rid, if he can be instrumental in getting rid of the regime, he'll also make money out of it. He has this money thing on the side as well. Um, this seems to be um, driving him as well. But he basically hates the Bolshevik regime. And he works with a number of Bolshevik, anti-Bolshevik crusaders in Europe um, 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 in trying to plot uh, with some Russians inside Russia uh, to renew this idea of a coup against uh, uh, the Bolshevik regime. Eventually, the, the KGB or the NKVD, as it's called then, lure him to Russia uh, on the pretense of um, being an anti-Bolshevik organization. In other words, they set up a, a um, straw organization, which is not a real organization, of, of reactionary Russians or anti-revolutionary Russians. Um, and they uh, ask Riley to come and maybe lead, lead the revolution against the Bolsheviks. Once he gets into Russia, of course, the Bolsheviks um, uh, nab him, they arrest him. And eventually, after um, milking him for information about British intelligence, they execute him. This it's, happens it's, in 1925. And it's very tragic. 20 years after Riley dies, his first cousin, uh, Felicia, who he 
probably was in love with when he was a young man and who he kept contact with, one of the few people he kept contact with. She dies in Auschwitz in 1945. So it's quite a tragic family story in some ways. Well, uh, the stories of European Jews in the 19, uh, around the 1920, 1945, the, the stories of European Jews are tragic and Riley is one of the more unusual victims, but he's there and as you say, his um, cousin is as well. And just to br bring it uh, to a conclusion, so you mentioned there, you know, the, the, Jewish experience in, in Europe, 1920 to 1945, uh, you know, within the series of these books, Jewish Lives, how, how would you situate Sidney Riley within the, you know, within the Jewish experience? I realise that's a really big thing to do, but I'm just thinking about the book series because you've taken someone who was Jewish, you've written a book on a Jewish life and it's in the context of other books on Jewish life. So how would you situate Riley and this, this broader experience? Well, he's one of the Jews who doesn't like being Jewish, uh, doesn't want to be Jewish, wants to distance himself from his origins and from his people, the Jewish people. Um, so in a sense, uh, belonging, uh, emerging in a series called Jewish Lives is a bit strange because the other ones, Einstein, Freud, etc., did not, Marx, they, uh, they didn't say they weren't Jewish. Uh, they admitted to being Jewish, and uh, some of them were proud of it, some were less proud of it. But um, Riley, as I say, uh, totally uh, rejected uh, this and uh, attribution, this affiliation. So it's a bit strange that um, the series would publish a book on, on, on him, but he wasn't the only Jew in Eastern or Central Europe who rejected his Jewishness, who didn't want, want to be Jewish. Karl Marx, of course, um, or his parents converted to uh, Christianity, and this happened to... Uh, among a lot of Jews, it didn't help them with the Nazis who they killed, they killed people who converted also, they didn't care. It for them, it was a matter of blood, not a matter of religious affiliation, but, um, but there were Jews like that. And the Nazis, of course, called them cosmopolitan Jews, people who didn't have a real anchor in any country. Riley did in some way with England, but, but um, he, his Jewishness was very unanchored, uh, at least so far as he was concerned. And before you began this book, Benny, was Sidney Riley already on your radar? Did you know much about him or did you have to kind of start from relative scratch? I have to admit that it was totally unknown to me. Um, um, I began to look after I was asked to write this biography. They sort of commissioned biographies, Yale University Press, in this series called Jewish Lives. They asked me to do it and then I learned about the man. I didn't know about him. I looked at the television series, the British television put uh, produced in the 1980s about him, which uh, with Sam Neill playing uh, Riley was very interesting, but I really didn't know anything about him until I started looking at his life, um, which of course is fascinating, but as I say, full of holes and you don't really know how much of that life is true. Well, this has been a really enjoyable chat and uh, I'm going to pass it over to Amanda in a second for questions, but I just wondered if we could uh, ask, Benny, in 1994, you co-wrote a book, Israel's Secret Wars on Israeli Israel's intelligence services. Can we expect a part two anytime soon? <laughs> no, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I've given up on intelligence matters. Okay. <laughs> That's it. That that's one of the reasons they approached me, probably because I'd written a book on Israeli intelligence. That they approached me about Riley. Yeah. Well, yeah. we'd love it if you you know rethought that. So, well, we got a lot of questions. I'm glad that you did watch the series, Benny <laughs> Riley, Ace of Spies, because we got a lot of questions about it. I was going to ask you if you were a fan when it came out and you've already answered that, but you have now seen it. And it, people of course wanna know how faithful is it to, who knows the story is so filled with mystery anyway. Um, what do they get right and wrong? And what, what, are, what do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of the show? We got a ton of questions about the show. So I'm okay, all, uh, all into uh, that. Uh, I will say that I was very impressed by Sam Neill, an excellent uh, actor from New Zealand who played Riley. Um, excellent acting, uh, 
Um, most of the stories of the, the, the episodes I saw, and I didn't see them all, I've seen some of them, uh, most of the stories are far-fetched and uh, Hollywood, they're not necessarily real uh, historical Riley uh, stuff. Um, but uh, Sam Neill carries it along uh, quite well, so it's watchable, very highly watchable. Um, getting into fine details, um, how did Riley make his money in New York? Well, basically, he sold and uh, sold uh, arms. He he that is, he was the middleman in arms sales. The Russians gave him a lot of money to buy arms from arms dealers, arms um, manufacturers in America. He got a certain percent from the Russians, and then he usually took a certain percent from the arms manufacturers as well. And left, incidentally, America with lots of money owing him by um, uh, the manufacturers who didn't pay up, uh, uh, for, uh, at least not the sums he thought he deserved. What What do you think he would be doing if he were alive today? Is he someone, do you think he'd always be drawn to the intelligence world or is he just, what would call out to someone like him in the 21st century? I think he would be high tech or businessman of some sort, probably high tech um, at the high end of um, commerce, uh, making a lot of money, maybe losing a lot of money, um, but, they, but being very adventurous. He used to make quack medicines, for example. In the early 1900s, he made quack medicines because uh, that apparently was something which sold at the time and he was unsuccessful and failed in it. But this he would have gone into... A serious cryptocurrency. I'm feeling cryptocurrency. <laughs> okay, you're right. I'm not into that, but cryptocurrency sounds like Riley as well. Yes. <laughs> what, um, why is he so? Is it just the TV show? Because I was explaining to my team, people sort of, you know, my age and older. I didn't watch it, but my parents did. But everyone knew that Riley is a spy. But how much you like how much uh, obviously he was appealing enough that that show was written but why does he have so much mystique that's still lingering today i'm not too sure but some of it is to do with his own self publicity that he ah. really, spies don't normally publicize themselves and here you've got a real live spy who actually is busy publicizing himself and in one or two major historical junctures world war 1 is a major world-shaking event, uh, the rise of the, the Bolshevik um, revolution and the, the control of the, you know, Russia is a, a major historical event, and he's right there in the midst of it. Most spies are on the edges. They try to find out how many battalions some army has, where they're stationed. Uh, uh, this guy was at the, in the thick of the, the, the historical events. You know, one of the things that um, we explain, Mata Hari is a, is a spy that we discuss in our exhibitions, and she had some training, but we always explain the reason she is so famous is because she was famous before she was a spy. Right. So I'm, I'm intrigued, you know, she was famous as this dancer and then becomes a spy, and so I'm, I'm getting that that interesting feel for Riley, who publicized himself as a spy. And there were circuits in the American, after the American Civil War, where people went on tour as spies. And maybe, maybe some of them were, and some of them, their stories were a yeah. little less, less well, likely. They wrote about him in the English newspapers when he married, when he got married, uh, can't remember the date, 1920-something, one of his, his third or fourth marriage. He was publicized as a spy. That is, he was he was said to have been a major spy during the previous few years in Russia, in Germany. They said there was not true if he ever was in Germany as a spy, but but they, they, this was all written in the newspapers. So he was like a popular spy. And then books came out about him seven years after he died, 1925. Seven years after, books come out about Riley by Lockhart, about himself, but also about Riley. Uh, his ex-wife writes a book about about him. So he's sort of in there. He's publicized. Yeah, that's what I hate, just keeping comparing this to Mata Hari, just because I know her so well. But, you know, she's not dead very long when there's already first a silent movie about her, and then a few years later, a talkie with Greta Garbo. So that is so interesting, this idea of the people, what, you know, 
getting a lot of play off of writing about him. So very, very intriguing. I don't know if you can answer this question, but was there one thing that was the most shocking or startling to you in this, or was it all just kind of? Well, there were, there are some, I don't know if the word shocking is right, but if the story about him killing him and another guy killing to uh, killing an anarchist co courier and robbing him of ten, several tens of thousands of uh, pounds sterling in the train in France. If that's true, that's a bit shocking, I would say. Um, um, and that's before before he becomes a spy. In other words, he's doing it as a, a robber, not as a agent of anybody. That, that's a bit shocking. Um, I mean, there, there are limits. You know, there should be some sort of morality and killing somebody and right. taking a lot of money is not um, not uh, is shocking. Yeah. <laughs> are there are there any lessons, bad or good, in intelligence work in his story? I mean, uh, does it does it say, tell us anything about intelligence work? Um, God knows. Uh, well, you have to know languages. You have to know languages, and this this guy knew languages. Um, you have to know how to disguise yourself, and he apparently did know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, Apparently, it's very useful for intelligence agents to have lots of mistresses everywhere who can put him up when somebody's chasing after him. This he was able to do very well in Russia, just to get out of Russia after the failure of that plot, basically because he had places to stay and women to help him. Uh, that's quite uh, apparently useful, yes. <laughs> Well, we will we are we will not endorse that as an official spy <laughs> museum <laughs> recommendation. But I, I okay, I can I, see that. I, I I hear you. I hear you, Andrew. Before I wrap this up, do you have any final comments? Uh, I think one thing that I would say would be obviously come to the museum and see the cigar box if you get the chance, or I'll buy Benny's know. or buy Benny's book, which I have here. Uh, it's a really good book and. Um, it's such a fascinating life it's really yeah I mean Benny points out at the beginning um, I'll just read a quote here in the first half of the 20th century he was considered the gold standard of intelligence in the Anglo-speaking world maybe even in the in the whole of the 20th century so we're talking about someone that you know has a very very interesting story and we really appreciate you trying to untangle the almost impossible ball of truth and falsehood and self-aggrandizement. And, and we are so glad, I remember the first time I saw, uh, saw the cigar box that it was the only, you know, it's amazing to have this, this physical thing that can really, um, as Andrew so um, beautifully said, really crystallizes uh, that that relationship so it has been really cool thank you benny for joining us from, thanks from for having me far thank far you, away and many and, and we worked out the time zones your time changed last night so that that's always fun so thank you uh, many people want to know this will be on our youtube channel soon i i want to thank our wonderful audience for being here and um invite you. Our, our next program will be Monday evening at, at 6.30 Eastern time. And we'll have, see, we have, we have intelligence analyst Alma Katsu, who Andrew knows well, who had turned in her analyst credentials and became a very popular novelist. So she'll be talking about her newest spy thriller, Red London, on Monday evening. And if you like this program or any of the others and you'd like to support our work at the museum, we'd be delighted to have a donation. It helps us with caring for things like the Riley Scar Box and getting Andrew and Benny here with all their brilliance. So thank you everyone so much for being here. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Amanda. Nice to meet you, Andrew. Nice to meet you, Benny. Bye, audience. Bye, -bye.